And we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to Feta. Today, we're going to be covering the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history, man, Samuel Little. Let's get right into it. We got a lot to cover. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what Feta covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. You see him reaching in his jacket. You don't know. And he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of two murder. Racketeering and Rico conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendants is, uh, six nine. And then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first started, guys, six nine ran. I'm a fed. I'm watching this music video. You know, I'm bobbing my head like, hey, this shit lit. But at the same time, I'm pausing. Oh, wait, who this? Right? Oh, who's that in the back? Firearms and violent crimes. AKA, Pooh Shicey violated. In order to stay away from the victim. Trapper Pooh Shicey arrested after shooting at King of Diamonds, oh, Miami Strip Club, injured one this person. Is the, this is the one that, that's going to fuck him up because this gun is not traceable. Well, it happened at the gun range. Here's your boy, 42 Doug, right here on the left. Okay. Sex trafficking and sex crimes. They can effectively link him to paying an underage girl. I'm going to lock my 50 minutes. And well, the first bomb went off right here. Suspect two sent down a backpack at the site of the second explosion. Inspired by Al Qaeda. Two terrorists, the brothers, the Zokar Sarnev and Tamer Lin Sarnev. When the cartel shipped drugs into the country. As this guy got arrested for um, espionage, okay? Trading secrets with the Russians for monetary compensation. The largest corrupt police bust in New Orleans history. The days of the police are gone. So he was in this bad boy. We're gonna go over his past, the gang ties, so that this all makes sense. All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Fed It, man. So as you guys know, I ran a poll on Instagram earlier this week and I asked you guys which serial killer you guys wanted me to cover. And overwhelmingly, I think it was around 55% of you guys wanted Samuel Little. Uh, just so y'all know, he has the most confirmed kills in U.S. history as far as serial killer goes. I tied them back to, I think, 93, and 60 of those were confirmed by the FBI. So you guys are probably wondering, who the hell is this guy? Here he is right here. Share a screen with y'all. This is Samuel Little, guys. Um, Samuel Little, born McDowell. Samuel McDowell was what he was born as. June 7th, 1940, died December 30th, 2020. So approximately two years ago, he passed away. Was an American serial killer who confessed to murdering 93 women between 1970 and 2005 and 2014. He was convicted of the murders of Linda Alford, Guadalupe Duarte uh, Apodaca, and Audrey Nelson Everett, and in 2018 for the murder of Denise Christie Brothers. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI's Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, VICAP, has confirmed Little's involvement in at least 60 of the 93 confessed murders, the largest number of confirmed victims for any serial killer in United States history. Guys, and you guys can see here is a picture of him in 2012. Uh, he was born in Reynolds, Georgia. Died in Los Angeles County, California at the age of 80. Um, and here's his nicknames, Samuel McDowell, the choke and stroke killer. Mr. Sam, choke and stroke killer. That's a first. I never heard that one before. And then uh, known for being the most prolific serial killer in the United States history by a number of confirmed victims. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's who, that's who he is, guys. Um, so let's go ahead and get into a documentary that I have for y'all. Okay. And this is Samuel Little, most prolific serial killer in U.S. history. This comes from Law and Crime Network, a pretty good channel here that makes some good content. Um, without further ado, let's get right into it. In 1970, a woman is strangled to death and buried in a shallow grave out in Florida. From there, for the next 35 years, bodies would be found across different states. No connection, no prime suspect. It would take decades before these cases would be solved and finally connected to one man. She was and of course, guys, when did he go crazy in the 1970s? As you guys know, we've talked about this before. A lot of the serial killers, most of the most prolific ones, you know, your Ted Bundy, your Jeffrey Dahmer's, your John Wayne Gacy's, Night Stalker, um, etc. The a Green River Killer, who I'm going to cover later on, the Toy Box Killer. All these guys operated between 19 the zodiac killer right they operated from the 1960s to about the 1990s and the reason why for that guys is because dna evidence was not uh used by you know the law the law enforcement world 
until uh, I think the first case that they ever used it was in the late 80s, and then they actually didn't start using it in a mainstream sense until the 90s, guys. So um, BTK, right, which they ended up catching him because of DNA. So a lot of these serial killers went crazy uh, in between the 1960s to 1990s. And Samuel Little definitely was one of them. He was, he was doing it, uh, as you guys can see, in the 1970s was his prime time. Pretty, a light-skinned, brown, honey-colored can. This is Samuel Little, also known as Samuel McDowell. I met her in, in a, a, a nightclub in New Orleans. So I cut off, I took off the exit, went, and that sure enough was the road leading into the woods. <laughs> And we went in and parked. He may not look like much when investigators began interviewing him in 2018, in his late 70s and suffering from health conditions. But the man you're seeing was the most prolific serial killer in United States history. I grabbed him by the legs and pulled him to the water. Mm -hmm. And this interview is an interview he did with Texas Rangers and FBI uh, agents. And uh, I think he did this in L.A. And th this was in 2018 with... Uh, some of the murders that he confessed to that they weren't able to identify who the victims were. That's the only one. And look at how he speaks so calmly about it. I am killed by John. That's just one confession of many that Little provided to authorities after his capture at the then age of 71. I'll never in my life ever interview another killer like that in my career. You know, you first see him, he's this little old man in a wheelchair. That, that will remind me of a little old man on a porch, rocking in a chair, telling you his stories about his life. Although his stories were demented. North Little Rock. Tell me what that girl looked like. Oh man, I loved her. She was a heavy set, big old yellow girl. He had buck teeth. <laughs> he had a gap between his teeth everywhere. She's too big for me to care. And he made that sketch himself, guys. He actually went back and sketched a bunch of the women that he killed that weren't identified. So um, the fact that he's able to remember this decades after the fact and recall details like this speaks to this guy's um, character. Crazy dude. Character. So I just pulled out the car and laid on that trash that was lit there. There was no remorse whatsoever. It was a matter of fact. I got him to kill. He went into great detail on his crimes. Oh, the only thing I know in all is that I killed him. And that was your intent? That was my intent. Sam Little ultimately confessed to 93 murders from 1970 to 2005. That's more than Ted Bundy, the Zodiac Killer, and the Golden State Killer combined. Holy God damn, this dude, bro. Oh, shit! Oh, shit! Killing people oh, all over the place. Um, And I will cover the Golden State killer for y'all this guy also was known as the original night stalker before richard ramirez um a lot of you guys requested him so i'll cover him as well he also came back and got caught because of dna about 40 years after the fact um and as you guys know i did a whole podcast on the zodiac killer i would argue the zodiac killer is the most infamous serial killer in u.s history um to this day still unsolved i know the the case break the cold case breakers came out and said that they think they know who it is um you know there's Two to three really good suspects in it, but we'll see what happens. And of course, I covered Ted Bundy, who um, the most televised, the first televised murder in U.S. history. Um, Thirty-three confirmed killer uh, murders all across the United States, from California to Oregon to, um, it's a, excuse me, Washington State, uh, Colorado, Utah, Florida, etc. They ended up catching him because he left a bite mark on a girl's buttocks that he killed at a college sorority house um, in Florida, ended up catching him, and you know, t uh, a forensic orthodontist was able to tie um, his teeth back to the marks from the victim. And on top of that, he actually represented himself in court, which is wild, um, and he escaped prison twice as well. So I did a whole breakdown on all of these guys except for the Golden State Killer. So if you guys want to go ahead and do this, watch the Zodiac one, that's a very thorough breakdown. I go over all the murders. And then the Ted Bundy one, of course, I go into detail uh, with his murders, how he escaped prison twice, um, him representing himself in court. Uh, but that is wild that Sam Little has more kills than all these guys right here. If I'm not mistaken, Ted Bundy had 33. Um, the Zodiac had five confirmed, even though he bragged about 37. And then, if I'm not mistaken, this guy, the Golden State Killer, had 
13 confirmed murders and I think 50 rapes. That's what made him uh, notorious is he break into people's houses and rape them. Um, but I will go ahead and break him break his case down for y'all in the future as well. We know of at least 93 women who were murdered. He was not going to stop. He actually told police that he found it sexually satisfying to rape and kill women. In order to really understand Sam Little's reign of terror, let's first dig into the killings themselves. Like many serial killers, Sam Little had an M.O. Did you ever shoot any of these girls? Shoot? Yeah. With a gun? <laughs> So I get no kicked out. All right. Man. So everything was done by manual. So it's as usual, strangulation, right? A lot of these serial killers don't like shooting and killing their victims. Are there some that do it? Yeah. I mean, you know, Richard Ramirez, for example, he didn't give a shit. He would stab, shoot, strangle, etc. But some other guys like Samuel Little, for example, um, took great pride and manually strangling their victims, and a lot of the times by their own hands. You know, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, same way. John Wayne Gacy used to use the um, the tourniquet knot uh, to go ahead and, and uh, tie up his individuals and strangle them. Um, and uh, who else? Ted Bundy enjoyed strangling. So most of these serial killers strangle, and this guy was no different. Strangulation. Did you ever use like a, a belt or cloth or no anything? No merits and all that. No, no ligatures at all? My hands. Just your hands? And without that, I would want to do it. He would. So he actually used his hands. Some other serial killers used ropes and, you know, BTK used ropes. He put bags over their head and choked them out. This guy strictly used his hands. Fucking on that demon time right there, man. <laughs> Take his hands and he would put them on their throats and he would choke them and sometimes he would allow them to uh, revive so he could see the fear in their eyes before choking them out finally. It was squeezing hard enough for the breath could be cut off and sooner or later she's gonna start going to catch her breath and that's when she tried to pull my hands off. It was too late man. Mm -hmm. Was it exciting to you at the time? Yes. Yeah. And, and um, you know, this is very common with a lot of these serial killers, guys, where they'll strangle their victim, watch them pass out, and then let go, let them come back to life, and then do it again, right? Ted Bundy used to do this. John Wayne Gacy used to do this. Uh, BTK used to do this. Um, now Sam Little. Like, a lot of these guys really enjoy playing God with, while torturing their victims, right? It's a very, um, it's a very sick mindset because... For once, right? Because a lot of these serial killers come from fucked up backgrounds where they weren't really able to control their circumstances. When they're murdering their victims, it's one of the rare situations where they are in total control and they have they have this God element to them. And they are in control of that person's destiny. And a lot of them get great sexual satisfaction and great uh, joy from this, as sick as that sounds. So that is why so many of them like to strangle um, sometimes stab, etc. Their victims because it's personal and they get to feel like God. He's a sadistic killer for sure. He wanted to feel like their neck swallowing. And I think his foreplay, basically, he would take a lot of them to eat and they would go eat and swallow and drink. And I think that was his foreplay. That's what got him excited is watching that neck. So how was it that Little was able to commit dozens of rapes and murders without getting caught. The reason Sam Little went undetected for so many years is because of who he targeted, primarily drug addicted women and sex workers. He didn't know who the hell was doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't go back to the same city sometimes. No. This is key guys as to why this guy wasn't caught for so long. Me another grape. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I mean, grape, so y'all got on to find him. Ooh, for sure. That one, right? There's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a good one. So basically, these were women nobody would miss. He refers to them as grapes. You guys could see how callous this guy is, right? And he specifically went after a certain demographic of women to keep himself from getting caught. He knew which women would be not cared about. He knew which women would not be missed. He knew which women would be susceptible to his advances, either whether they're romantic or he was providing them drugs or providing them alcohol. She, she was a hoe, yeah. She was a hoe. 
Oh, she was trying to make some money now. He knew which women on the lower levels of our society he could actually lure into his car to take to a secluded place to quickly kill them in the dead of night where nobody could see them, and then to dump their body immediately and get out of Dodge. This is how he got away with it. And I'm not just saying, he says it. Mama, you didn't get in out there with the people that will be immediately missed yeah. and very important to either family or business or somebody. Yeah, you got pretty good at knowing which one. Well, I'm not going to go over there in the white neighborhood and pick out a little uh, young teenage girl or like the way they just do. <laughs> and that's how little guy and that's that right there guys i mean you could see from his mindset like i'm not gonna go take one of these white girls from the neighborhoods or someone that's gonna get missed i'm gonna go after people that no one cares about i'm gonna go ahead and go after you know minority prostitutes in crime ridden areas where no one's gonna miss them no one's gonna care no one's gonna go looking for them after they go missing and that was a key to him being able to do this for so long. And on top of that, he was a vagrant. He was traveling all over the place. He was, you know, living in many different states, driving from state to state. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, some, some criminologists theorize that the rise of serial killers in the United States is directly tied to the inter, uh, interstate highway system. And I would agree with that because, you know, if you're, you know, if you commit a crime in a little town, a little area, and then you jump on that highway and you go to another state. Well, that police department, right, is going to be virtually powerless to really stop you because, you know, number one, back then they didn't work with other agencies. Number two, technology was limited. Number three, there was no central databases to allow law enforcement agencies to communicate with each other. Um, there wasn't, uh, you know, DNA wasn't a thing. Fingerprints were really the only main way. And sometimes that was even limited. And forensic... Um, Forensic uh, testing and all this other stuff was in its infant stages, if 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 it was even being used. So, uh, interstate highways, right, allowed serial killers to be able to commit a crime, get out of dodge, and that police department a lot of times was powerless to do anything. And I've told you guys before, the agencies that typically conduct murder investigations are the state and local agencies. This is how guys like Ted Bundy, right, were able to wreak havoc in different states and no one knew what the hell was going on. He was able to travel to, for, you know, from Washington state to Idaho to, I think he had one or two kills in California, um, Colorado, Utah, Florida, etc. cetera. They were, he was able to do this thanks to interstate highway system. And before the refinement of law enforcement database systems that allowed agencies to communicate with each other. So, um, you know, little was no different. His biggest thing was he preyed upon, minority prostitutes as well which added another layer of insulation to keep him from detection over and over again and because he did this secret because he did this same mo over and over again he got very good at it coming up little had spent his life in and out of prison and had almost been captured before so what happened i've been lucky on a number of times yeah yeah, he got arrested almost a hundred times, by the way, guys. Wild stuff. I wanted to be in the back, some would conceal. So she was already dead in the car? Yeah. Okay. After Samuel Little is arrested in 2012 on a narcotics charge, investigators realize he's actually responsible for several cold case killings. Little would ultimately confess to 93 murders. Prior to his capture, though, Little was a man who had been arrested almost a hundred times and only spent a total of 10 years behind bars. So how was he not connected to these crimes sooner? And more importantly, how was he? Look at all these mugshots through the times, guys. Been arrested damn near every year. <laughs> it's like his annual checkup going to going and getting arrested. Still on the streets for all this time. I was lucky in Florida. Mm -hmm. I had a dead body in the car. Mm -hmm. That's what you Choked out. Yes, and I'm getting ready. But blue lights everywhere. Police car and come back behind the building. 
He seen us parked there. I jumped out of the car and tried to act like I'm zipping my pants. He said, oh, what all the fun? What's going on over here? I said, nothing. I said, me and my wife just coming in the course. Put the damn car. Look in that window with a flashlight. I'm telling you. Shining right on the girl. She laying up there like that. She got it. Dead. Yeah. And as soon as he was looking in there, I said, yeah, I'm right here. I tried to get his mind off of her. Just that nigga time before he took a second look. And I got away like that. He said, well, you got to get out of him. Wow. I got in the car. Bruh, what the hell? El police officer down there in Florida. God damn. He had just finished killing somebody. Police officer comes up on the scene, doesn't realize that it's a dead woman, lets him go. Wow. The police weren't able to put together a strong case against him because he himself knew how to get away without leaving a lot of evidence. I knew cut, stab, burn, bit. No, no blood. I don't like blood. He would initially strike. He doesn't like blood. <laughs> oh, man. But I guess he likes choking his victims in the head and then strangle them. And I think ultimately, when you think about this, you're not going to have any forensic evidence later. The bodies have deteriorated. Not to mention, this guy had some um, had some fighting skills. If I'm not mistaken, Sam Little did have some boxing training, guys. So he would hit the girl without her noticing, right? That, you know, because he'd pick up a prostitute. She'd think, oh, yeah, this guy's very charming, whatever. I mean, when he was younger, he wasn't a bad looking dude. You know, it's not common to run across a African-American guy that has like, yeah, like greenish blue eyes, right? Obviously, that's going to be very distinct. You know, girls like that type of thing, whatever. Pause. And, uh, you know, he picked them up, you know, he'd charm them, whatever. They'd go out to eat or whatever. He typically would take his victims to go have something to eat. And he, kind of a sicko, but he would watch them eat and he'd look at their throat. That's what he liked was watching their throat <laughs> on some evil time shit, right? And then when he got them back in his car and they'd be driving, he would just like, bam, just punch her right in the face, right? And she wouldn't even see it coming. Sometimes knock her out cold, and then he would strangle her. So a lot of these ladies didn't even see it coming when he would hit them. But he would just strike them one time, bam. You know, and as a trained fighter, that's all it takes. So there were no markings. There were no, you couldn't see knife wounds to bones. You could not see gunshot bullets. There was no fractures in these bodies. I'm not about pig farmers. Oh, no. And that's how the girl, they found the girl that landed in the field next to Big Farm. Let's all the mother in the office. The, the rats got to uh, Sam Little would dispose of bodies in the Everglades. He would roll them down hills. He would put them in densely forested areas. He would let partially conceal by the vegetation. Left for there. DNA didn't really start being utilized until the mid 1990s so he was able to, to get away with any type of sexual crimes alabama did the same thing i had this black chick up in the car and uh just got through canada that's about pull up with this chair pull up Nobody ran the plate or anything like that. No. So they didn't put that on. He didn't run the plate. Nobody, no, he wasn't looking for no. They found the body, man, about a month later. And also, I want to make a note here, guys. I don't know if you guys are noticing it. Um, You know, the two people that are conducting the interview with Sam, you know, they're agreeing with him. They're using the same terminology, black, pluck them, right, etc. I know some of you guys might be like, well, that's disturbing. You guys just got to understand that when you're interviewing criminals, right, you need to identify with them and a lot of the times that comes from sympathizing with them using their own terminology making jokes you know they talked about college football etc when they're talking with him you need to be able to build rapport and a lot of times building rapport with these criminals you have to get into their mind and you have to think how they think and a lot of times that's going to put you in a mindset where and say things that might be seemed as deplorable on the outside but for you to get a full confession for you to get the information that you want you have to identify with them okay so just understand that these investigators are sympathizing with them as a technique to garner information. Even though he had 100 arrests and served only 10 years prison time, I would blame partially the criminal justice system because a lot of the cases against him were dismissed. 
they weren't followed up with and he was fleeing constantly. He was very transient and leaving to different areas, cities across the nation. Little had had close calls before, but nothing may have come as close as to when he was directly tied to two brutal murders. You know, we caught him. We believed he was responsible for Melinda Lupri's murder in 1982. And we know absolutely he was responsible for Patricia Mount's case. Now, when you're driving around with Patricia Mount in the front passenger seat, did you have any conversation with her? My mind was on killing her. She let me feel her throat, you know, caressing it. And before I knew it, I uh, tightened my hands around it and trembled it up. After Patricia Mount's nude body was found in that hayfield, Hair fibers and witness testimony linked Little to the killing, and he went on trial. Yet once again, it was Little's lucky day. The jury found him not guilty. Oh, As for Melinda man. Dupree, a grand jury. L prosecution, man. L prosecution. Opted not to indict him. Other media has come to us saying, you know, if y'all had just tried him and he was in jail, all these people would be alive. And I will tell you that Melinda Lupree had been out in the elements for over three weeks. Um, and if you saw a picture of, the, of, of her remains, you would understand there were no evidence there to gain. There were so many things, so many times that uh, he was arrested for, for assaulting women. And the women were ladies of the night. They were on, on drugs. And those don't make the best witnesses, unfortunately. A combination of lack of hard evidence, issues with witnesses, and Little's own ways of covering up his crimes resulted in weak cases and him continually striking plea deals for shorter prison stints. Jillian Lauren, a New York Times bestselling author and someone who spent hours interviewing Sam Little, has made it her mission to be the voice of these victims. Because of um, the fact that they were often prostitutes, often drug addicts, often women of color, um, women who were considered unimportant, or as some cops used to talk about the women who were turning up in South Central dead almost every morning in the 80s. Um, uh, NHI, no humans involved. But you know, it, it wasn't just cops. He was tried by a jury of his peers. Once again, it's us who let him go. Up next, Little's crime spree comes to an end, but his story is just beginning. I had a desire, a strong desire, to f*** her and kill her. And she played with you a little bit on the way out there, and you killed her in the car. Yes, I would try it for it. You beat it, too. <laughs> Samuel Little, who's come to be known as the most prolific serial killer in United States history and whose crime spree spanned from 1970 to 2005, was able to elude justice for years. That is, until 2012. The prosecutors and the police were never able to actually pin a case on him until he left his DNA. California actually had a case where they had run DNA on a cold case, and uh, they had an identical case, or one that was a similar MO. And when they tested that DNA, the DNA came back to an identical person in Sam Little. In Bam, obviously this took years to do, but that's the power of DNA, especially with cracking the serial killer cases, because you guys got to remember, a lot of the times, the victims are random. So, you know, motive is difficult to, uh, to figure out, um, a methodology... Uh, all the only thing you can really look at is like pattern. So DNA is critical because it's very difficult to tie a serial killer to a victim because the victims are random a lot of times. September 2012, Little was arrested in a homeless shelter in Kentucky on an outstanding California drug charge. When he was extradited back to L.A., investigators such as Detective Mitzi Roberts were able to link Little's DNA to material left at crime scenes in the 1980s. I was already putting together a San Little case because I was working all the cold cases here in my area in Mississippi. Uh, Los Angeles, Mitzi Roberts called asking, do we have anything about a San Little case? So she came down, interviewed our witnesses to put together a, a method, uh, an, an MO of, of the killer Sam Little. Uh, it fit everything with their cases. In 2014, 
little. And that's the power with technology and agencies working together, sharing information. Oh, this is your MO. This is my MO. Holy shit. This is the same guy. This is my crime scene. This is your crime scene. What did you find at your crime scene? This is what I found at mine. And this is the power when agencies work together and are able to piece information and pieces of evidence together to link it to one suspect. Who was convicted of the murders of three of his victims, Carol Alford, Audrey Nelson, and Guadalupe Apodaca. But in a way, Little was also answering for all the women he had killed. They were human beings and that they were all totally different. They're you. In September 2014, Little was sentenced to three consecutive life terms in prison without the possibility of parole. While Little had maintained his innocence his whole life, in 2018, he finally decided to open up to investigators. What's up, man? It's so good to meet you, and I'd like to personally thank you uh, for being generous enough with your time. I hope I can clear up some of you. When somebody is incarcerated and they know they're spending their life in jail, their communication with the outside world is, in essence, gone. You're so valuable to society at this point, I think. Am I? I work up to these people. I thought I was a worthless. That's playing to the serial killer's ego to get the confession. Thank you. Thank you for saying that I'm worth something. He opened up because it was his exit strategy. This was, again, part of his overall plan. This guy definitely was ready to talk as soon as he knew that he wasn't going to be receiving the death penalty. That's the letter that you requested, that uh, our state attorney will not pursue the death penalty under any circumstance. And that is a very big bargaining chip with a lot of these serial killers is they'll confess to their murders and give information, you know, under the pretense that they are not executed. And, and Ted Bundy tried this, uh, but they ended up executing him anyway. He tried to, you know, get a last attempt to save himself and... Uh, no, they weren't playing around in Florida. And that what ended up getting him executed was he killed, a, I think, a 13-year-old little girl, which is pretty sick how we did it. Um, but you guys can go ahead and check it out on the other episode I did on Ted Bunny where I break down all those uh, crimes. Now the question became, how do you get Little to open up? Well, I'd love to talk to you about Gainesville a little bit. You know, that's that's where I live well, and I'm work. Not, so. I'm, not a, I'm not a Gator fan, I'll tell you right now. You must be Ohio State, yes, though. Right. You, you know what it. Urban did for our Gators, though. Thank you. See? Wow. <laughs> sports is a huge way to build rapport with a lot of these crooks. Guys, I fucking hate sports. But when I used to interview suspects, I would talk sports with these guys. I'd get, you know, aware of ESPN. I knew what the hell was going on. So I'd be able to talk sports with these guys and build rapport because – a lot of the times you have to befriend these guys first. It's not like the movies where, you know, you go in there and you shine the spotlight on their face. Hey, asshole, tell me everything I need to know. No, that's not how things go. Nope. You need to go in there. A lot of times it's building rapport, talking about stuff that has nothing to do with the crime at all. And then, you know, slowly getting into the criminal stuff. But yeah, man, I remember there were interviews where I'd go in there and I'd talk with them about random stuff, sports, hobbies, going to the gym girls, womanizing, whatever the hell it is, for 45 minutes plus, you know, hour and a half, talking, just shooting the shit about life, uh, you know, where they've traveled, where have they been before I even get into the criminal stuff, you know, and that's what it takes a lot of times to get the best information is they want to like you first before they tell you, you know, some devious things they used to do. Well, that, yeah. Now you were a USC fan too, or no, no, no. no. But, okay, stand California fans. Uh, <laughs> see, at least he's right about that. California trash. But you lived <laughs> out in California for a while. I lived there several times. It's going to be Little's interview for sure. I wanted to make sure that myself, as a prosecutor, was uh, going to be somebody that he wouldn't mind talking to. We knew that he liked the Cleveland Browns. He's from the Cleveland area. We're from the Cleveland. And so that kind of uh, was our cash, if you will, uh, to be able to build this report with him. What do you remember about talking s and talking How I did it? I talked to him straight. I told him he was a big perv. And I told him I didn't agree with him. And he would say, what do you All right, so that right there, guys. <laughs> It's not how you, you know, build rapport with criminals and get information, which, of course, you know, she's an angry feminist that doesn't know any better. So, of course, she's going to go in there with her emotions stupid, and try to get some information. But at that point, by the time she had inter interviewed him, he had already come clean to law enforcement. So it's like, whatever, I'll give your bimbo ass, uh, you know, an explanation as well. But 
um, you don't want to go in there with emotion and fuck you and all sort of bullshit. It doesn't work that way. You know what I mean? You got to go in there and you have to identify and sympathize with these guys. That's how you get confessions. But I'm not surprised that an emotional feminist would go in there and say some stupid shit like, you're a big perv. Like, duh, dummy. We know that. If you want to go ahead and get the most information, shut your mouth. Listen to what the guy has to say. Calling them names typically never helps. Call me a perverted homicidal maniac. And I said, well, that's like certainly one of the things I call you. And he was just like, whatever, you're a hoe. I was mostly. <laughs> she belongs to the streets. You probably wasn't far off that she's a 304, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> I'm honest with him. Coming up, Little may have confessed to numerous murders, but how do we know if he was telling the truth? More when we return. Think all court shows are the same? Right. We're talking about. Hold on. We're going to skip these stupid commercials. After serial killer Samuel Little was finally caught in 2012 and convicted of murdering three women back in the 1980s, he decided to confess to more of his crimes from 1970 to 2005. And that's when the floodgates opened. So I kill a girl there. In Ocala? Gangsta. I killed a girl over there in Ocala, too. She also talked about a uh, young lady that she dumped down a stairwell. Yeah, a white girl. That was a white girl? Yeah, she was white. I got her out of the car, pulled her out, and drug her into the groups back then. Little ended up confessing to killing 93 people and would ultimately plead guilty to several more murders. How do we know, though, that Little was actually telling the truth? I am. This is actually very smart what they did here to see if he was actually telling the truth because a lot of the times, guys, these serial killers will, you know, let's be honest here. We covered BTK. We covered the Zodiac Killer. You know, a lot of these guys are clout chasers, man. They do anything for clout, right? And letters to the police, to the media, I'm the killer, taking credit for crazy shit that they may or may not have done. Um, People love to be, you know, get attention, to be recognized, and people do anything for clout, as uh, Offset famously said with Cardi B, right? So they have to establish, all right, he's coming forward with all these murders. 93 is a lot. Let's see if we could throw a curveball here and see if this guy is telling the truth. So this was very intelligent what they did here. Absolutely believe in his credibility of the stories that he told. He knew everything about my crime in 1982. And then the 1977 remains actually had a wig on. Nobody knew that but the anthropologist and us. And he talks about she had a wig and he threw it out the window after he killed our, our, our very first victim. In one other case, he was able to tell what the last item that a lady had eaten was basically the carrots out of a salad and brown coffee. And the autopsy report shows undigested carrots and brown coffee. And that also was from the 70s. Holy God damn. It's pretty damn accurate. Remembers her eating carrots and coffee, and that's what they found on the autopsy. But it would have been dark for you, so I don't know how these pictures can really help you. No. I don't, that must be the blanket. Yes. And that's also a telltale sign as well, guys, is whenever the criminal is able to identify things that only the police and the crook would know, that's when they know, all right, this is our guy. For example, the Zodiac Killer, I explained to y'all one time, he killed a cabbie, right? And he ripped off a piece of his shirt and sent it to the uh, to the, uh, to the newspaper. And he attached a piece of the bloody shirt there. So that's how they knew, holy crap, this is the real killer. So that's what a lot of times the killers will do to show I'm the real deal. Because you know, let's be honest here, if it's a notorious killer, people are cloud chasers. They'll come in and say, oh, yeah, it was me that did it. And, uh, you know, they don't show any proof. How did you remember that? It was also important what Little said he didn't do. We were all sitting around talking, and, and the detective says, yeah, you know, he, he killed mine. He drew a picture of her, and I said, what year was yours? And he said, 1998. I said, no, nope. I'm saying, look. I said, he was not out in 1998. So when they go into the interview room, and this detective is starting to talk to him about that case, and, and I'm thinking, golly, if Sam Little confesses to killing this one, that's going to throw this whole story in the in the, in the break. I mean, it just, none of it's going to be true. And, you know, he looked at him, oh, yeah, I'm in the house, yeah. But I didn't kill that one. He said, I was going to kill her. He said, I came back to kill her. 
but she was gone. I couldn't find her. Then I said, well, Sam could have took Brevin for one, did not. And um, and so they told me he's not out there just, just trying to get numbers. He's out there wanting to talk about his cases. Now we get a sense of this. Oh, bam, that right there adds an enormous amount of credibility because even when shown uh, a murder and the detective thought he might be the suspect, he was like, nope, that, that body's not mine. I thought about killing her. I knew who she was. When I came back, I couldn't find her. So um, so that you know adds a tremendous amount of credibility to show, okay, this guy isn't just in it for the numbers in the club. Killings. But what drove Sam Little? The choking with these women happened before the sex or during or at, right afterwards? What did it mostly happen? I choose, I picked, I choose her out first. You pick the ones that you think you're going to kill? No. First. No. If you want, it depends on how I'm next. So clearly a lot more. Very, very, very strange. Uh, depends on how our net look. Um, so now we're going to get into uh, part two of this uh, breakdown. Okay. Um, let's get right into it, guys. Now we're going to get into Sam Little's background. But let's take a step back. How did Sam Little become Sam Little? Sometimes to get to the end, you have to start at the beginning. New York Times bestselling author Jillian Lauren knows that well, as she spent hours interviewing and studying Little. I speak with his family. They ask me all the time, how did this happen? Why, why, why? Early childhood, sexual abuse, physical abuse. Yeah, you were born in 1940, right? I was born in 1940, yeah. Okay. He went to reform school for stealing a bicycle. It's called Boys Industrial School in Ohio. His family will also tell me he was... It was nothing but trouble even before he went there. Then he just got. That's how you could tell it's old. That thing freaking it's all faded. That's how you know that you know that's an old ass document. Abused and abused and abused. He grew up in Georgia. His mother was 16 when she was pregnant and she was in the sex worker industry. He talked about his mother. His mother had, uh, had left him on the street corner when he was a uh, uh, described it as being so young, he was almost a toddler. What's really interesting here is the type of victims that he selected and his relationship with his mother. The victims that he chose were very vulnerable. They were sex workers. They were, some of them were addicted to drugs. These were low income minority neighborhoods. She was an alcoholic and she couldn't catch a trick no more. She was, she was in a position where a, a whore that was, couldn't do that no more. The women in Little's life arguably defined him and also shaped his criminal career. That includes his longtime girlfriend, Aurelia Jean Dorsey. You were a traveling man all your life, right? How did you make money to buy cars, shoplifting? All right, so this is how he survived, guys, because this dude used to travel from state to state, which is a big reason why he was able to commit a lot of these crimes that we discussed earlier with the interstate system and the rise of serial killers, especially... Um, in the 70s all the way to the 90s, which actually is when the interstate system was starting to flourish. Uh, but this is how he actually made money and survived. Jean was, uh, she was 70, something young. She about 30 years older than me. And he met her in, in jail in 1970. And that was who was shoplifting all the goods that allowed him to travel from state to state to state, city to city killing these prostitutes. So he was a thief by day and a killer by night. He's a shoplifter. Uh -huh. And I was the driver, and we go all over the country, everywhere. There. I stop in places overnight in the motels. She, she's an old lady, you know. And I can go out the street looking for a girl. That's how I got around so many places. From 1971 until Dorsey's death in 1988, Little and Dorsey made quite the team, whether she realized it or not. Because of her, you were able to kind of go around, right? Because well, she, she had the, the money coming in. Yeah, right? she, she, she knew you were going out with women. Yeah, she knew. My man was finessing. He was using that old lady, you know, shoplifter with her, against the money, and then going out and killing chicks at night. She didn't know that there was, like, no killing going on. No, right? she didn't know I was going that far. She didn't know I was going that far. Bruh, this guy, man. I kind of wonder if she was this maternal replacement figure. And so there was this respect and adoration towards her. 
Aside from the reported 47 disciplinary infractions he received at reformatory school in his younger years, Little was repeatedly arrested for burglaries and even assault. However, it was in 1970 when things really change. The first victim I had was in, uh, uh, by his first kill, January or February of 1970. By January or February of 1970. Okay. Over in Miami, Coconut Grove, Miami. Yeah. First killing. Did you know that you wanted to kill it? Yeah. Yeah. I had desire, strong desire to f***ing kill her. Coming up, inside the mind of a serial killer. Strangled women. So I had that in me for the guy. It was psychological, I guess. Wild. All right, let's fast forward this thing. Rolling. Convicted murderer Samuel Little spent his youth in and out of trouble for various offenses, but it's believed that on January 31st, 1970, Little killed his first victim, Mary Brosley. This was the start of a 35-year killing spree, which Little claims resulted in 93 murders. So why did he start? Well, for one, only four years earlier, he had been arrested for assaulting a different woman. I believe that was the impetus for him to say, I will not leave a witness alive again. Yet Little's interviews with investigators in the media revealed another motivation for not only how he ended up choosing his victims, but how he killed them. One of the themes that we believe in the reference to Sam Little was the neck. He, he, he was excited by the victim's neck. You pick the ones that you think you're going to kill? No, first. no. If the one depends on how the neck got a smooth neck and turned as a child I, I, I got attracted to the, the uh, neck, the neck part. Yeah. So you pick them out by the way that their neck looks because if the neck looks good then there might be somebody that you want to have sex with or somebody that you might want to kill. What what's the what's the thought? Both. Both. Is, okay. When he put their hands around our throat he wanted them to swallow so he could feel their Adam's apple. If it was a pretty neck, you, you were probably going to be a victim. If you had an ugly neck, maybe maybe not so much. But the other stuff is all right. So all the fat chicks out there, what? you guys need a the turkey necks. What the fuck? Y'all are safe from this <laughs> crazy individual. It wasn't don't be important to me. This she yeah. could be skinny and narrow. Right. She oh. could be ugly. Uh huh. She could be fat. She could yeah. be skinny. Yeah. She, she ain't gonna be fat because the fat ones next is right. Too much. Right. Yeah. He actually. <laughs> Oh my God, this guy is fucking wild. Uh, see, even serial killers don't want to deal with these fat bitches. God damn. <laughs> oh Lord. Felt that he could have murdered before 1970. He used to touch women's necks while he would be engaged with sex with them. You had had that desire before that? But I had it, but it, it wasn't. Uh, but you never did it all never the way. Never did it. All did the way. No, never just did the choking, it. but never all the way to death. Never no. all the way to death. Okay. But it was a fantasy of his. And when he did it, it was easy, and it was something then that he didn't want to stop doing. He just went out of control, I guess. Uh -huh. And then after that, he. It, it was Interestingly, Sam Little's last known murder occurred in 2005. That was seven years before his eventual capture. So why did he stop? Little got old, and that's why he stopped in 2005 at the age of 65. That's a career. He still had the same urges to kill women. But physically, he was failing. He knew that he might get caught. A man literally had a serial killer career. He retired in 2004 after 34 years of murdering people all over the place. God damn. 1970, 2004. Caught if he continued to try to physically kill a woman and then, more importantly, try to get rid of their body. Sam Little's criminal career of sexual assault and murder can be characterized in many ways. But how Little himself views what he did, well, that's something he was very particular about. He's a man that did not want to admit that he raped anyone. In his own mind, he wanted to be known as a killer rather than somebody that would have to take by force sex from the woman. 
while we were dancing, she says, uh, you, want, you want to go riding after this, you know, after this party's over? So she had an arm in arm walking to the car. He is very invested in the idea that he does not hate women. He loves women. Fourth Little Rock. Tell me what. Right, that's Cap right there. My man. <laughs> Stop the Cap. Uh, yeah. that girl look like? Oh, man, I loved her. Most people luckily don't have to know about the mechanics of strangulation, but it hurts. And he did hate women. Of course, the feminists had to slip that in there. We, duh, we know that. Like, stupid. And then I would, you know, then we went further, you know, and I choked her to death. Little was an erotic aggression subtype of rapist. And these rapists choose women who are vulnerable. They like to control them. They act out very aggressively and they act on impulse. This subtype is the least common of all subtypes with only about 10% of serial rapists having this erotic aggression. He was so attached to this idea that he didn't hurt them and God made him the way he is. God gave me this twisted desire where sex and death got all twisted up inside of me like a pretzel. That was my weakness. I guess I never could get that out of my mind, mixed up with sex. And he would say, well, killing somebody is no different than stealing a cookie from a cookie jar because every sin is the same and that's Jesus and that's the Bible. Wait, what? What? Bro, they rationalize any way they can, I guess. What huh? the fuck? And I said, actually, I think there's kind of a hierarchy. What's the first commandment? An answer. Don't wave this book around as a justification for killing women if you never read it. He was killing women for sex. That was sex for him. When we return, sitting across from a murderer. Yeah, he was scary to be Like, psychologically, he's frightening. All right, fast forward this a little bit. Why did you and already serving life sentences for multiple murders, serial killer Samuel Little decided to confess to his killings in a series of interviews. This helped investigators solve many unanswered questions about numerous cold cases. What was truly amazing, though, was Little's ability to recall details of his crimes from decades earlier. Las Vegas. Describe the Las Vegas victim. That was in 93. She was got thin dark skin, about 40 years old when she was out there hustling. How tall was she? She was about five, 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 three. When we were speaking to him, he would go from talking to us in the third person to all of a sudden being there. And he would have a far off look as if he's right there doing it. We over him behind a furniture factory. Prop right there. I choked out. He was able to say specifically where he dumped her body down a hole. Steps go down, lay down to the basement, but he had a rail, rail around it two way. You couldn't fall down them steps. You had to go around to the steps. So I threw, I threw her down the steps. Mr. Little had a very keen memory. It was almost photographic. He never took trophies. His trophy was up here in his mind. He would relive in his jail cell and his holding cell, each of these killings over and over again. Remember some young lady you dumped? Uh, yeah, in the tires. With the tires? Oh, yes, sir. Well, yeah, you yeah. tell us. Oh, oh God, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. What do you remember about her? The eyes and that face. During his confessions, he is smiling. He's reminiscing. It's nostalgic for him. I think that these were good times for him. Little also shocked the world by actually drawing sketches of his victims, which investigators have been using to solve these cold case murders. He remembered some of the names of the victims. Think about that, guys. He's able to go back into his memory, remember what the girls look like, and draw detailed sketches on the women he killed. This is from the 70s and 80s. This is decades, right, ago. And he's able to recall it. So that tells you to the mindset that this individual is under. He remembered wardrobe. He remembered buttons on some of their clothing and zippers. This went back all the way to the 1970s. It takes a special 
type of intelligence to have that ability. I saw that he drew petechial hemorrhaging in their eyes, which is what happens when you strangle women. I was looking for evidence. I was like, what's the detail that he noticed about them that could possibly connect it to a confession, connect it eventually, hopefully, you know, to a cold case, to a Jane Doe. The people who interviewed Sam Little found themselves in a unique position. They were there to find out more information about these killings. Yet in the process, they became close to a brutal murderer. We started writing letters. He sent me a Christmas letter. Um, and he talked about wanting to help me solve any case that he thinks he did. If I would send him the information, he would do whatever he could. Our conversations veered from uh, sports, boxing, my kids, my meatloaf. He liked to hear what it was like to actually be a human being. It made him feel like one for a minute. And then he would talk about murdering. Despite any pleasantries or bonding, don't for one second think that interviewers ever forgot who they were speaking to. I'll just say that when you see his hands, you'll see just how monstrous they are. I didn't feel in danger myself because I knew that he didn't mind men. <laughs> I, if my daughter were in that room alone, if anyone's daughter was in that room, he may still murder that person, even though he was 70 years of age. He felt he could get away with it, he would. So Did you ever shoot any of these girls? Shoot? Yeah. With a gun? <laughs> My answer. His reaction says it all. So he was not dead, I would want to do it. He was really scary. I was always sort of calculating how long it could take to really do damage and how long it would take for a guard to get to me. Like yeah, he would definitely strangle your feminist ass, I'll tell you that. You'd probably annoy the fuck out of him. <laughs> Psychologically, he's frightening. Up next, do we know about all of Little's killings, or are there more? Stay with us. Think all court shows are the same? Right. We're talking. Fast forward this thing a little bit. You think somebody would have found it eventually? Yeah, I think it very, very rarely could have found her. Through serial killer Samuel Little's confessions, Law enforcement and prosecutors from different states were able to solve dozens of cold case investigations, and Little was finally convicted and sentenced to multiple life terms of imprisonment for several murders. At the time of this taping, over half of his killings have been confirmed. He spoke about 93 different cases. So far, from my understanding, 62 different female bodies have actually been identified as his killings. And I'm sure that there are more bodies out there. There's a continuing investigation still going on with the ones that were never identified. And we know some of these weren't listed as homicides. They were listed as either overdose deaths or they fell off a ravine. Sometimes the damage wasn't really available to say that it was a homicide. And some of these were mislabeled. I wish the hell I did. But we can be turned back. It, I mean, not only hurts, but more that I'm regretful for what I'm constantly saying, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Well, for this family, they have closure now. You know, you've confessed to it. You've told us what you did, how you did it, why you did it. And I personally thank you for that. Is it possible, though, that Little told investigators everything? Or could he be responsible for more killings that we don't know about? I believe he's responsible for about the number that he actually said, 93. Yeah, I think he's credible as well. I found him to be very credible as far as that. He was not boasting. Uh, he was very matter of fact. Uh, he wasn't trying to be the worst of the worst. My only suspicion is that there might be men. Tell me about Mary Ann. She is what you not a call a transgender. There are three transgender women in his victims in the confessions. If there are victims he did not confess to, I, I think there were men. While the work continues to verify Little's crimes, unfortunately for authorities, he can no longer help. Samuel Little died in 2020. He was rattled. 
at the end, he was definitely going downhill. He would say, I'm not on my deathbed yet, but I've done everything in this life now but die. And I was like, no, you haven't. Because you're going to help me. And we're going to find more of these victims. Sam made me his next of kin. His family doesn't want anything to do with him. So I got the call. I'm still dealing with his possessions, his remains. With Sam being dead, it's a loss because I couldn't go back and check details with him. Sam Little may have provided much needed closure to both law enforcement and the victim's loved ones. But in the end, it never changed who he was or what he did. Mr. Little was not sorry about anything that he did. He was, at one point, trying to say that he felt bad for the women that he killed. He had nothing to say about the families and the devastation that he caused across America. He was a parasite. And he deserves to be where he is right now. In the grave where he sent so many women. Yeah, and he died of natural causes, unlike the, the women that he killed, man. So uh, definitely got what he deserved there. I honestly got more than he deserved. But uh, so, okay, as you guys can see here, what I'm also going to show you is this is from the FBI's website, guys. Okay, their official website, as y'all can see, FBI.gov. Uh, confessions of a killer, right? <clears throat> um, FBI seeking assistance in connecting victims of Samuel Little's confessions. Okay, five years after analysis of the FBI's VICAP uh, program began linking cases to convicted murderer Samuel Little and nearly 18 months after a Texas Ranger began to listen from uh, elicit from him a breathtaking number of confessions the FBI has confirmed Little to be the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history. He's confessed to 93 murders and they believe uh, all of his confessions are credible. Law enforcement has been able to verify 50 confessions with many more pending final confirmations. So now we're up to about, I think, 60 according, let's see here, uh, 93 yeah, the, so involvement in at least 60 of them, all right? So um, so pretty much, and they're still, you know, asking for the public's help, you know, in this. So that tells you right there and then that, you know, this is obviously the real deal. Um, so, and they have videos here of people they killed. This is the transgender woman he talked about, uh, Marianne, killed her in Miami, Florida, 1971, 1972. A couple other videos of unsolved murders that he's done, right? So they have a confession video along with the sketch that he drew. Right. And this is him throughout the years, which they were using in that documentary. Uh, and then here's the murder locations, guys, which I found crazy. Y'all can see all over the place. L.A., Vegas, Phoenix, Houston, Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, Tennessee, Arkansas, Illinois, India, uh, Ohio, uh, all the way up to, um, you know, different parts of Ohio. Well, even Washington, D.C., it looks like um, South Carolina. And, of course, all over Florida. And you guys can see here, these are all, the, um, the rest of the sketches here, these are unmatched victims here, guys. So, uh, you know, they're still looking. Um, and you guys can see here all the victims that he was able to draw, he remembers. So, yeah, wild, wild stuff. He's no longer alive anymore. But, um, but yeah, he is... At the moment, the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history, guys. So, um, yeah, wild stuff, wild stuff, wild stuff. Hope you guys enjoyed that video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. And, um, yeah, uh, let me know, comment below what you guys want me to cover for the next serial killer case. Um, we've covered a bunch of them out at this point. Um, but I'm thinking Green River Killer might be or Toy Box Killer. You guys have been requesting those two quite a bit. But uh, other than that, man, love y'all. Hope you guys enjoyed this breakdown. I catch you guys on the next episode of Fed It. Peace. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what Fed It covers Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. You see him reaching in his jacket. You don't know. And he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of premeditated murder. Racketeering and Rico conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendants uh, 6'9. And then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first.